Welcome, everybody. We have James Hughes, who's the executive director of the Institute for Ethics and Emerging Technologies, an organization that's been around since, um, is it the early 2000s? Yeah. Um, 2005. 2005, right. Okay. Yep. Yeah. And yeah, his, uh, James Hughes is a sociologist and has got a, um, a long background in politics as well uh, and is um, has been very active in the transhumanist and future, futurist movement for quite some time. And today we're going to be talking about the future of work, which is a topic that concerns a lot of us. Um, and I, I guess I guess most of the people in the modern world who um, earn a wage in order to survive. Uh, and I'd, like I should say that IWET has been focusing on this subject um, of recent. So, yeah, do you want to talk about the Future of Work project at IWET? I do. Yes. First, yeah. Um, the and first to say something about the IET. The IET uh, grew out of those of us who were involved in the World Transhumanist Association and who. Uh, shared some common assumptions about the kind of political order that things should happen within, that there should be accountable democratic governments, that they should have social welfare systems, that they should have regulation of medical technology, things like that. The World Transhumanist Association was primarily concerned with human enhancement technologies. When we started the IET, we wanted a broader uh, gambit of issues because there are philosophical and policy connections between attitudes towards things like climate uh, remediation, genetically engineered crops, and the attitudes that people have about medical technologies. So we eventually settled on the term techno-progressive, which is the idea that there are a group of futurists, you know, within the futurist uh, community or people who are interested in future technologies, there are many who are hype masters, you know, who think that everything's going to be crypto or everything's going to be metaverse they're, and they're trying to sell you on something. There are people who are the kind of techno libertarians or techno utopians who think, oh, there will never be any problems if people all have nuclear power in their basement. What could, what could be the problem with that? Um, and then there are the people who think that uh, those things could be problematic, need to be, their risks need to be evaluated and regulated, that democratic governments have responsibilities to make sure bad things don't come from technology. If you believe that, you're on the liberal or regulatory end of that futurist spectrum of people. But there are lots of people in the public policy domain who don't believe in the possibility of those technologies to begin with, the ones that the futurists are interested in. They, uh, you know, if you try to talk to people in the health infrastructure of Washington, D.C. about how they're planning for longevity medicine that might extend people's lives 10 years, they're not. They're not thinking about what's going to happen if that happens. So the techno progressive sphere are people who take certain kinds of technologies seriously and think that they need to be addressed for their egalit their. Uh, their impacts on uh, inequality, their potential catastrophic risks, and so forth. In the domain of work, um, one of the ways that uh, this has manifested for us is that we have been interested since our beginning in the potential impacts of artificial intelligence and automation on technological unemployment. And technological unemployment, when I say that, I mean uh, a reduction in the overall amount of work that is available for people to do in a society for pay. Um, and not just structural unemployment. Structural unemployment is you introduce the automobile and a bunch of people who make uh, uh, horseshoes have to get jobs in factories making automobiles. They have, there's some retraining, maybe they have to move to Detroit or something. That's just structural unemployment. Technological unemployment is really the idea that the overall amount of work is going to be reduced by these processes. Now, since 2000, the uh, proportion of Americans who are in the paid employment has been declining, sometimes rapidly, sometimes, you know, it's, it's uneven by year, but it's overall it's been declining from like 67% of the population in paid employment to 61 or 2% right now. And um, that is partly one of the reasons that, that that is occurring is partly because of technological changes in the economy. 
It's also because of the retirement of the baby boom. There's a large demographic thing happening here. So alongside our commitments in the IET to thinking about and taking seriously the prospect of technological unemployment, which the futurist techno utopians would say, oh, well, you know, future technologies are going to make everything so cheap and you'll have a nano printer in your, ba in your, your, your back pocket. And so everything that you want, there'll, there'll be these free, um, you know, templates to make anything you want. You'll be able to have anything you want. So no one will need a job and everything will be fine. Don't worry about it. Um, and we're like, well, between everybody losing their job and everybody having magic nanotechnology, there might be a decade or two, maybe, and then a lot of people might die. So let's try to figure out what we do about that. And one of the things that we have always advocated is, un or in general, is universal basic income. The idea that the welfare state could be uh, reimagined to provide a basic floor for everyone that is that severs the relationship between your right to live and your need to find paid employment. Um, and this is not terribly different from the basic promise of social democracy for the last 100 years, which was that no one should have to starve, that the disabled, the old, the infirm, et cetera, should all be given a basic platform uh, under which they can't fall. Um, but the, the difference is to say, maybe that should just be everybody. Maybe we should give something to everybody as a basic right. And one of the arguments for that is that if you only give it to the poor or the disabled, then it's just this tiny fraction of the population um, who get it and they're not a powerful political constituency. But everything that you give to everybody, for instance, social security or Medicare, more or less being a universal program, although it's just real, but the, the more universal program is, um, the more political support it has and the more people want to increase that. And that's one of the reasons why the right has always opposed universal provision programs. So we've, anyway, for a variety of reasons, we've supported universal basic income and we see it as a potential solution to technological unemployment. Now, the other thing that's connected to that is the demographic questions around work, is that, as I said, the uh, amount of people, the proportion of people in paid employment has been declining, but it's mostly due to demographic changes. It, as for decades, people in public policy have been anxious that the ratio of workers to retirees and pensioners was going to be going in a very bad direction over the course of the 21st century, that there was going to be a crisis, an entitlement crisis, social security and Medicare were going to be bankrupt, et cetera. There's a real problem. In the American context, you can just debunk that pretty quickly by saying, well, if we taxed people's incomes above $120,000, there would be no social security crisis. But anyway, there's a lot, number of public policy arguments you can make, but there is a basic problem because fertility has been crashing around the world. Uh, the demographic estimates that, um, you know, that we would just smooth out at two ch children per couple turned out not to be true. And so in Europe is shrinking, uh, China is facing a demographic crisis, <coughs> excuse me. Um, and we're going to be facing a situation very soon and already are to some extent of uh, too few workers supporting too many senior citizens. Now, if you think as we do, that there may be a solution to that, what we call the longevity dividend, if we can keep seniors healthy longer, um, then they, they consume far fewer resources. My, my father-in-law just spent a year dying. And um, the cost of providing him 24 hour care uh, as he was dying was astronomical. And you know he did not have a 10 year death process from dementia, which many people are gonna have. He had a, a different set of issues. But um, if you can keep seniors healthy longer, then we might be able to, to get to a point where the social uh, welfare system would not collapse under the weight of this gray tsunami that we're worried about. Um, one of the things that they could do if you keep them healthy longer is continue to work at least in white collar employment or part-time employment if they wanted to. But if there's not gonna be any jobs because of robots, <laughs> then we're back to square one because 
forcing old people into the labor market is not going to be uh, a healthy solution. So, you know, raising the retirement age, that's what a lot of countries have been considering in response to this demographic crisis. That's not going to work if, you know, you're 65, you were a truck driver your whole life, you get laid off at 60. The, the, the number of people claiming disability in the United States, by the way, has been skyrocketing. And that's because um, it's one of the few ways that you can say, I, I'm done working and I just, I can't do this anymore. And for people in blue collar professions, not only are they more at risk of being disabled, but anyway. Okay, so there's a lot of things going on there, but we've been concerned with both of those angles of it, the old age dependency ratio and the technological unemployment. Um, the recent initiative that we started, the Future of Work Initiative, we started, uh, or we started thinking about it in 2019 when we got an extraordinary gift to begin addressing these issues. And we thought, well, let's talk about these things I just mentioned. Then the pandemic happened. Now the pandemic has raised a whole new set of work-related issues. You've got the great resignation. You've got the fact that people across the industrialized world are uh, apparently rethinking what kinds of jobs they wanna do. They're putting new wage pressures on employers. So in terms of auto automation, it's interesting. You know, If you decide, hey, you know, 15 bucks an hour for flipping burgers, that's not really going to, you know, uh, do it for me. You're going to have to pay me 20 bucks an hour. At some point, there's a tipping point between the cost of a burger flipping robot and a burger flipper, a <laughs> human burger flipper. And so the better that we make working conditions and wages for people, the closer we're going to get to that burger flipping robot that will make that job irrelevant. Now, that's not an argument for not having higher wages. That's an argument for thinking about what we're going to do when that happens, when those kinds of jobs disappear and whether there is going to be what, what the, an economy could look like after that. So that's the great resignation is feeding into that. Remote work is feeding in, into that. A lot of people, Sarah and I were just talking, people in our kinds of professions, data scientists, that's my day job being a data scientist, um, it, we don't have to be in the office to do our work. My, me and my staff, we transitioned to being remote workers with seamless, no one noticed. We could have, no one still notices whether we're in the office or not, right? And about of a third of the American workforce has uh, now expressed uh, that their job can be done and they would prefer to do their job remotely because they do not need to be in the office to do it for myriad reasons. You know, my if I were to commute from my house to Boston every day, it would take me three to four hours on the road. So I, I have an apartment in Boston, which is extremely expensive and uh, has been empty for the last two years. So yeah, I have a very personal stake in this question about whether I need to be in Boston or I can stay here in my house. But at any rate, remote work is part of this thing. And universal basic income, because the first move that a lot of countries made in response to people need to stay home so that they don't die was to give them an income. You know, Canada giving people you know, like 60, 80 percent of their income just to stay home. So universal basic income went from being a fringe public policy idea, although God bless Andrew Yang for raising it in the American consciousness because he actually ran for president on the idea of basic income. But it was still a French idea and he didn't get anywhere with his campaign. Um, and then suddenly the pandemic happens and everybody's gone, hmm, universal basic income sounds like a good idea. Well, maybe we should think about that for the future. Um, and in addition to its stimulative effects, its Keynesian stimulative effects. So at any rate, now the future of work program that we're addressing, and we've just hired uh, a postdoc to work on this program at U UMass Boston, which is behind me in this picture, um, UMass Boston, where I work, we uh, have a cooperative relationship with the Applied Ethics Center in the philosophy department, IET does, and um, we're going to be jointly managing the work of a guy named Alex Stubbs, who just got his PhD in uh, his philosophy, I think. Uh, he's got his PhD at Loyola University, and he's very interested in, in a fascinating question about electronic work platforms how workers get exploited by gig work on these new electronic, you know, like Uber and things like that, and what the cooperative options there are. And so this is, uh, you know, you can find lots of leftists who will attack 
uh, the precarity of modern work and you know the how terrible it is that people are being exploited by Uber and you know poor restaurants and they they don't get as much of a cut off of selling their food, et cetera, et cetera. What Alex is asking is, okay, what's the democratic alternative? A lot of people want the freedom to decide I'm gonna I'd like to spend a couple hours driving today and make a couple bucks. They that's the preference that they have, right? What they don't like is being exploited for their labor and not getting the full uh, income from it that they could get. So what is the alternative to that? Is there a way to imagine this kind of work in a cooperative and democratic uh, way that is empowering to workers and gives them the full benefits of their labor? And I think that's a fantastic question to address. Okay. Yes. Thanks, James. So um, <laughs> please prepare your questions, everybody. Uh, I guess we can kick off with um, talking about this great resignation and this sort of um, distaste for exploitation and, and uh, you know, getting sucked into social media or, or more fun things that we can do during the day. Not necessarily fun, but addictive things um, versus the, uh, you know, the the fulfillment that one gets from doing one's job, you know, the, the, I guess the, that, that, the fulfillment of doing a, um, a hard day's labor for, for a wage, for, for your crust, you know, working of, of the sweat of your brow. So at the end of the day, um, you've done your work and any small amount of sort of joy you get it at, at the, the end of the day is then amplified because you've worked for it. Right. So, I mean, yeah, there's, it seems as though these two motivations are pulling in different directions here. We've got one where people are sort of re resigning, they feel like maybe have a sense of hopelessness. And there's another, other people who really want to go to work just because of the value that they get from their job. Well, um, this, this debate has been going on for a long time. Um, on the left, for instance, uh, Karl Marx's son-in-law, a guy named Paul Lafarge, was a French, he said, I, I'm a Marxist uh, father-in-law. I, I really like your ideas. And, but he, then he wrote a book called The Right to be Lazy. And um, Marx was like, no, you're not. You, you're not at all the same as me because he was arguing that it was capitalism that had convinced us all that we had to support ourselves with paid labor, you know, wage labor, wage slavery, as some of us call it. Um, and I think that that is a socially constructed, historically specific uh, set of beliefs, that the majority of humans did not uh, think that it was immoral to find a way to live without wage slavery. And um, most aristocrats found the occupy uh, things to do with their day besides putting a gun in their mouth and they didn't have to work for a living. And so the idea that we need to work for a living for uh, because it's more moral or because it, otherwise our life would be meaningless is obviously socially constructed. I say that, however, when I did face my, my personally, when I faced unemployment, I nearly lost my mind. So I, I understand the dilemma, which is that if you live in a society where you have been sold that bill of goods, it's not, a, it's not just simply a question of saying, well, I don't believe that anymore. I, I don't need to have a job to have a meaningful life. We still need a transition and a cultural change so that we all understand that, um, you know, spending your days painting or writing poetry or sitting in your hot tub is equally as valuable as, as you know, healing the sick or whatever. And I, when, even when I say that, I don't even really believe it, but, you know, I, I think that's kind of the dilemma that you're pointing to. I'm sorry, we've got some questions and comments coming through. What should I look at here? Uh, let's see, wonder, does James have an opinion on the likelihood or possibility of automation leading to a fully automated luxury communism future? Okay, good question. Um, I definitely like the direction of thinking of Bastani and the other post-capitalists, you know, Paul Mason and uh, Shrinicek uh, and Williams and people like that. Um, I do think that uh, this is the preferable vision for the left. It's not a workerist vision. This gets back to the previous conversation. There are a lot of people on the left who would argue that um, it's absolutely a bad idea to argue for a post-work future. We, we need to be guaranteeing everybody a job. Now, I think there's compromise between the two positions because for the time being, maybe for the next couple decades, 
um, there are going to be jobs that robots can't do that needed to get done, like taking care of old people, planting trees. I mean, I think you could probably get a tree planting robot pretty easily, but there's gonna be a lot of jobs that can be done better by humans for a while. And so I think if we reoriented social priorities towards work, um, we could have a transitional full employment program that also included universal basic income and social services and so forth. But at any rate, uh, the fully automated luxury communism idea of a post-work vision, I think is in the long run, the correct vision. The part of the vision that I have a problem with is the post-scarcity part, which not all address, but some include. And that's the idea that at some point we're, and, and this comes from Marx and, and others as well, the idea that you get enough of stuff at some point, and then people won't fight about stuff anymore. It's like, I don't think we're ever gonna to get to that point. You know, I'm, I'm also right about Buddhism and Buddhism says, you know, that the fundamental cause of our suffering is our desire. Um, and it turns out that desire is pretty bottomless pit. So, you know, you, <coughs> my wife is an artist and <coughs> if she was rich enough to, you know, use as much art as she wanted, you know, much gold as she wanted for stuff, uh, then she probably would imagine the next art project using more gold. I'm not saying that she's avaricious. She's actually pretty moderate in her taste. But, um, but in general, you know, let's say Elon Musk, you know, he's got, he's, we're a rich enough society, Elon, so go ahead and build a rocket. It's like, okay, but I want to build two rockets. Okay, well then that, if you build two rockets and I can't build my rocket. So I don't think we're ever going to be that rich where there's not going to be conflict over stuff. So for me, there always is going to have to be a regulatory mechanism. And some people in the post-industrial or post-scarcity society camp think, well, we'll just have a computer figure it out. It's like the computer will determine who should, what everyone should get. It's like, well, <laughs> I don't think that's going to work either. You know, um, I think there has to be some mix of private property, market exchange, and state regulated exchange. And I do want computers to be involved because I think that computers in the long run are gonna be able to do our economy better than markets do. And this is called the calculation debate, the debate that basically the classical free market economists won when looking at the information constraints on a planned economy versus a market economy. And they said, um, it, you know, for instance, in the Soviet Union, that it was impossible for the Soviets to ever, in the first place, because everybody lying, but even if they weren't lying, um, it was impossible for the Soviets to ever know enough about the economy to make rational market choices and say, this kind of, this amount of stuff needs to go here today and, and so forth. Markets in the 20th century did that better. And that's why in the long run, the Soviet Union collapsed, had to revert to capitalism. That's why Deng Xiaoping decided that uh, they could not stick with planned economy in China and had demonstrable success industrializing China with markets so, and, and became a capitalist country as unequal. And uh, as the United States, <laughs> we can talk about China later. But um, so I think you need to have the vision that eventually we could increase the sphere of planning in society and the, and the uh, kind of rational distribution of things in society with, uh, with computers and artificial intelligence and so forth. It could overcome this calculation, this informational problem. But in the long run, I don't think any of us want to live in a society where you can't make a pot and sell it to your neighbor. That does not sound like a utopia to me, where it's illegal to sell stuff to your, your friends and your neighbors. So I think we always want to have market exchange. So that's the only part of that uh, Falk vision, the, the fully automated luxury communism vision that I have a problem with. I guess uh, earlier in the decade, or early in last decade, um, there was a quite a popular book that Diane Anderson and uh, Steve Coulter or somebody like that um, wrote called Abundance. And they were arguing that if there, there was an abundant economy, if there was an abundant of material goods, then um, it would be the case that people's basic needs at least would be fulfilled, material needs, and that would solve a lot of the problems. Do you think just getting over the hump of providing basic material needs for everybody will reduce um, a lot of the problems in the world? The, the, this uh, elimination of basic needs scarcity 
will reduce the need like uh, wars or um, conflicts and will able, uh, enable people to coordinate a lot better? I think it actually could do the opposite. Um, and one of the arguments for that is what's called post-materialist political theory, which is the argument that there's kind of a hierarchy of needs. And as you satisfy the basic needs for survival, then people start worrying about other stuff, you know, their self-actualization and values and whatnot. And some people see the, dis the disengagement of politics in the United States, for instance, from basic economic redistributional issues and the increasing shift towards kind of identity, you know, tribal identity and race and gender and, uh, you know, abortion and religion and, and so forth. You know, basically being, being a college education and church attendance are the two strongest predictors of who you vote for in American politics. It's not whether the party is offering to increase your wages or not, or increase your pension plan. Um, and in fact, people often vote against their own economic interests because of their identity interests. So I think a, a post-scarcity society could actually be worse in terms of conflict because people wouldn't have that fundamental set of, of economic questions to hold them together anymore. Well, someone commented um, that in, in, in the chat that uh... They think that science, or they said curiously, science fiction tends to exempt Buddhism from its general vision of a post-religious future. What do you think about well, that? Some of you, well, some by of the you way, like, do you want to, do you want to um, let people know that you used to be a, a Tibetan Buddhist? It, like, you know, no, you don't the Tibetan, road. But, oh, not to, well, I, I was a Tibetan. I was a Tibetan Buddhist. That's true. I, I became a Buddhist when I was 16 um, and taught Buddhism when I went, when I was at college. Um, and the first folks that the first Buddhist group that I joined was the Tibetan Buddhist group. But I've always had an eclectic uh, approach to my Buddhism. And when I graduated back in 83, I went to <clears throat> Sri Lanka. And uh, five days after I got there, and I was full of uh, left wing Buddha mystical enthusiasms. I, I thought, you know, Basically, I'm going to try to synthesize my passion for achieving enlightenment with global revolution. When I got there, uh, a civil war started between uh, the Tamils and the Singhala. And I found myself in the midst of race riots uh, where Singhalese Buddhists were beating to death Tamil Hindus, uh, being led by Buddhist monks. And that um, put a kibosh on some of my romantic fantasies. Now, my first move was to say, oh, they're not the real Buddhists. You know, that's just the fake Buddhists who, who misled everybody. Um, and then I met actual Buddhist scholars and they said, uh, no, I'm afraid this is all of Buddhist history has been like this. Buddhism's gotten a pass, had gotten until recently a pass from a lot of the West saying, oh, Buddhism's a rational religion, it's religion of peace and blah, blah, blah. It's like, oh yeah, well, there have been Buddhist monarchs, there have been Buddhist pogroms, there have been Buddhist genocides. Um, and now we know in Sri Lanka and in Thailand and in Burma uh, or Myanmar um, and in you know, other countries, there have been uh, Buddhists who do terrible things. So Buddhism is not exempt at all. Um, and so, uh, as with transhumanism, I'm no longer a proselyte of Buddhism. I, I don't think that Buddhism solves the world problems. The reason I continue to identify with the tradition is that um, it's still my mythopoetic language. It's still the, the idea of a human being being able to uncover and unlock the potentials of the human mind and discover a peaceful way to relate to uh, the vicissitudes of existence. That is still my preferred uh, spiritual idea. And the mythopoetics of people sitting under a tree is preferable to me to someone being crucified on a cross or whatever religious iconography you, you prefer. So um, I still identify with the Buddhist tradition, but I'm, I'm not a Buddhist proselyte anymore. At any rate, um, so the question was about do I think it's worthwhile? No, I mean, talk to Aung San Suu Kyi. I mean, right now she's again under house arrest by the 
allegedly Buddhist military dictatorship of, of Burma, but when she was in power, um, she uh, apologized for their genocide against the Rohingya. The Sri Lankan Buddhists, as I've already noted, have a long history of racial nationalist mobilization. And, and my experience in Sri Lanka was really um, what led in part to my writing the book, Citizen Cyborg, because one of the questions I have is, what, it, what does it mean to have an identity that isn't, that doesn't lead to these reactionary genocidal consequences? You know, what are the kinds of identity that we could construct for a new 21st century polity um, that would not divide people, but would actually unify them? And, and that's what I was trying to get at with Citizen Cyborg. And, and that partly came from my experience of Racial nationalism always has reactionary consequences, whether it's a left wing or right wing. You're anybody, anybody in the audience, do you want to um, ask a question vocally? <laughs> if so, please unmute and yeah, fire a question away. Um, let me I say think... something about, let me say something about universal basic income and work uh, again which is that I think the, the debate has matured considerably since we started thinking about it 15 years ago. I mean, George Dvorsky and I went to the Universal Basic Income Conference in 2006 and gave a paper about technological unemployment and stuff. Um, so, but now there's a, a much more sophisticated debate. One of the things I think that is clear is that we don't want a future in which everybody gets their lump of, uh, I, by the way, if you've seen The Expanse, um, this is also uh, one of the central features of the expanse is that the, uh, on the earth, um, everybody who's unemployed and most people who are unemployed get basic and, um, and it's not an uh, enviable existence. But at any rate, the, um, I think one of the things that's very clear now is we don't want a future uh, in which um, unemployed, the, the mass of people are unemployed and receive basic and then uh, only the wealthy and advantaged have the benefits of meritocratic access, even meritocratic, not to mention you know, nepotistic, but even meritocratic access to the few remaining jobs. That's not uh, an ideal vision of the future. And we also don't want a future in which everybody gets their dole check at the beginning of the month and they can spend it on anything they like and the wise ones will spend it on housing and food and insurance, but the unwise ones spend it on booze and end up in the, in the second week living on the streets. And you know that's not an ideal future either. So there are certain social services that I think are indispensable in a future society, uh, guaranteed education, guaranteed medical care, uh, guaranteed, uh, I, I'm not a, I, I think we should, defund the police, but I'm, I don't believe we can ever abolish police. I, th I think, you know, police services are going to be necessary in the future. So there are certain publicly funded services that I think are always going to be necessary as a complement to and as a, an, a, a container for a society in which we hopefully give people more and more pocket change um, because they're citizens to spend on whatever they like. That, I think, is a much more sophisticated understanding of the UBI. And it's not the one that the right wants. The, the right wants to eliminate uh, the, the welfare state completely and just put it all into pocket change. And I don't think that's what we want to do. So at any rate, I think there's a lot more to talk about with the UBI idea, as well as the ideas that you brought up, which is the meanings of work and, and things like that. Okay, I can unmute. Okay, so I mean, the idea of universal basic income I guess that's the first one of the first iterations in in, in in as a modern response to automation. But um, what what if we um you know we give a lot of people um a basic income, and then those who have act who, who uh, I guess uh, have most of the resources or most of the uh, limited resources, the finite resources like real estate, I guess um you know uh, natural resources and things like that. Um, the owner ownership of large media channels and things like that start ratcheting up their prices to get the lion's share of all the money that's divvied out to um, people, right? And so this universal basic income really becomes like just rent assistance, and you know, it, it, 
So, I mean, how do we stop that from happening? Do you think people should have universal basic um, real estate rights or a place to live? Universal basic uh, accommodation? Well, I'm in the evolutionary socialist tradition. So I don't think you go from being a screwed up society to being a perfect society overnight. I think you have to have an understanding of what the evolutionary path to that might be. And uh, as I've already said, I don't think that we want a society where everybody gets a, 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 me a meager and minimum basic, and then the, the rich get to live in gated communities and jet around the world and have bases on Mars or whatever. Um, one of the reasons that we can't have that society, I think, is that to have a true universal basic income. Right now, if we took all the social welfare spending and we divided it up among all Americans equally, it would amount to like $4,000 or $5,000. And that's if we can convince seniors to get rid of social security, and, you know, et cetera, which we're not gonna do. So um, the, if you really want a basic income that meets minimum poverty standards, um, then you have to redistribute the wealth because the level of inequality has to be reduced by taking the windfall profits that the uh, top 1% have been skimming off the rest of us for the last 50 years and put it back into everybody's pockets. And I think that is an important project. And that immediately calls into question the argument that UBI is something the left and the right could agree on because the right not gonna agree about that. So um, what the right can agree to is that everybody gets $5,000 a year and it's just, yeah, it, it will tide you over for a week while you find your new wage slavery job. Um, anyway, forget the original question, but uh, the, that kind of inequality is unsustainable. And I do think that a redistributive program, progressive taxation program is a part of this. Now, having the, uh, a society and a politics to accomplish that kind of redistribution, how we get there is a whole nother question because if any one country tries to do that, they get impoverished by that effort, right? That's the, the prisoner's dilemma of social democracy. And so for a couple of decades, I believe that what we need, if people understand this reference is the Trotskyification of Keynes. Trotsky said that you couldn't have socialism in one country. He was talking about the Soviet Union Keynes means you can't have uh, redistributive, stimulative, social democratic policies in one country. You know, if you if when Francois Mitterrand tried to uh, establish uh, in '81 uh, a relatively aggressive set of socialist reforms, all still democratic, he wasn't expropriating people's wealth in France. There was a capital strike, and eventually he had to pull back from that. When Michael Manley tried to do it in the 70s in Jamaica, they pulled back as well because they, you can't do it in one country. What you can do is do North Korea. If you want to do North Korea, you can do North Korea. But, Nor but Burma eventually decided that doing North Korea was not so great. And so they said, well, let's give this openness to the world, economic investment, liberal democracy international legitimacy thing to try. And then they decided, uh, actually, no, let's go back to North Korea. Right. So, so, I mean, okay. How are you going to convince the power, I guess, you know, the, the current, you know, the, the elites, the people who have the power, the people who have access to the levers uh, of power to get on board with this? I mean, it, it, how are we going to manage that? I mean, there's a lot of people out there, you know, with private interests who want, who, who would rather just um, have most of the resources to themselves. So how do you convince them to give them up? So for instance, if there was a country that was ruled by kleptocratic oligarchs um, who surrounded a politician who was their friend and he decided to start a war because the only people he heard from were the 10 guys that he made rich. Uh, how do you stop them? I don't know. Maybe you just have to shoot them. I mean, I'm not, I am an evolutionary and democratic socialist, but I think in the end, there are certain kinds of power and certain kinds of conflicts where it takes force. 
Um, but in the United States, I think we still have enough democracy that if we decided to tax Bezos and Musk and the super profits that have been uh, accumulating in the hands of the top 0.1% with progressive taxation, then yeah, if they want to migrate to Europe, I don't think it's going to be much better for them in Europe. If they want to migrate, if they want to go live in uh, in Bolsonaro's pr Brazil while he's still in power, then maybe they'd be have a tax haven there. But you know, this is why this is the importance of what Biden. Uh, the Biden administration did like six months ago, which is an international agreement to start raising corporate taxes. What we need next is true international action to identify the uh, ill-gotten gains of the corporate elites and the, and the super rich around the world that are in tax havens. The Panama Papers re revealed that, for instance, all the folks who've been stashing money in the Cayman Islands and Delaware and, you know, in the different states in the United States that are tax havens for this kind of stuff. So yes, it's possible. We just need the political will to do it. Just like we need the political will now to get sanction, effective sanctions against Putin. There are certain kinds of sanctions which will hurt the bottom line in New York and London that people are still like, ah, but I, I think there's enough political will in this situation that we could actually start taking money from the oligarchs the Russian oligarchs. Now we need to stay t also start taking money from the Western oligarchs. Well, this is um, a common concern for, you know, people who have been living on the upper crust, the high off the hog for so long. Is there worried about, you know, the, the poor um, or the, the middle class sort of moving into their territory and, and getting a, a share of what they have. And they're worried about this sort of apocalyptic uprising against them, this sort of pent up anger that's been festering for so long that, um, you know, somebody's going to rush at them with pitchforks and, and you know. Well, I, maybe some of those of us in our futurist network will know who Peter Thiel is. Uh, you may remember him if you just are familiar with American politics, that he was the only tech titan to back uh, Donald Trump. And he has now resigned from the Facebook board because he's an odious person and they didn't want him on there anymore, but, um, and a political liability, but also because he wanted to devote himself full time to campaigning for far right politicians and Trump. Um, and Peter Thiel is an example of the kind of futurist on the far right of the futurist community who decided a long time ago that the problem in the modern world was democracy and the ability of people to ever take any of his toys and, um, and who bought himself citizenship in New Zealand in case things went south in the United States. And he's been doing his best to make sure they go south as quickly as possible. Um, and who doesn't believe in climate change and therefore, you know, we doesn't think we need the climate remediation, which might prevent some of these uh, crises. Anyway, you know what I'm talking about. They're, the, the super wealthy have been building their bunkers. We know that they build their bunkers and we need to, and, and bunkers are a short term measure anyway. I mean, what are you going to do after the apocalypse to hold on to your power? I mean, you're going to, uh, apparently some of these bunker builders have thought about putting shock collars around um, the people who serve them in their bunker. It's like, I don't think that'll work very long. Um, in the end, um, we need to take their wealth away and their ability to make bunkers. And then maybe when there are fewer bunkers, they might get more serious about fixing the world's problems. But I got a little far away from work. Let me mention another work issue related to this one, which is uh, work in the metaverse. Now that I am a, such a fan of um, remote work uh, or the ability basically for me to uh, migrate from my bedroom to my office um, as work, uh, I'm also becoming increasingly interested in the idea of work in the metaverse because I like seeing my employees and staff and coworkers in Zoom. I think that that has added tremendously to uh, the email culture that I was used to from before. And the possibility of having more full virtual simulations of real-time spaces in the metaverse is actually very attractive to me. And I understand that many people see this as a dystopian possibility that people would be spending more time. I mean, I think it's dystopian. I don't wanna walk around with stuff on my head all day. Um, so it would have to be miniaturized into my glasses and I would actually prefer augmented reality instead of full virtual reality so I could do other stuff. But at any rate, I'm very interested in a future in which we do more of everything in the metaverse. 
And, um, and I'm writing now about metaverse regulation, about what it would take to have the kind of metaverse that we really want and need. Um, but it, there's been very little attention to what labor rights are gonna look like in the metaverse. And I think this whole controversy about um, NFTs is fascinating. We do need to have a way to determine if you are non -fungible content Non-fungible tokens. Non-fungible tokens. Um, if you make something in the metaverse or own something or buy something um, and somebody else makes a copy of it, is that theft? And what does it mean to own something, make something to be reimbursed for the products of your labor if it can immediately be duplicated, right? And so NFTs are, were a lame attempt to fix this problem and they didn't. Um, and half of all the NFTs that have been sold have been sold for things that people don't actually own at all. Um, but uh, we do need to figure out this question of intellectual property rights and what property means in this context and how we're going to manage property rights. And it could be that we have different rules about property. And it could be that you get, uh, the, you know, with, as with the NFTs, you get an original, but everybody else can make a copy or something like that. So um, I, I think that this is an expanding area that we should be thinking about in terms of what work is. And it also relates to what a meaningful work is. Is it... One of the problems I've always had with remote teaching is that um, for me, actually be seeing, having the physical experience of seeing a student, seeing their comprehension, communicating to them face to face was an important part of the teaching process. And um, when you just made that into text, it became very um, un unappealing for me. And I think for a lot of people. But the degree to which you can increase the bandwidth of the communication between us and simulate all of those virtual cues. You know, we don't do in the metaverse, the current metaverse, we don't do legs very well, but you can have things that will detect the emotions on your face, for instance. Um, and so the, the degree to which we can start to fill in the full details of a face-to-face -face interaction in the metaverse, I think will make certain kinds of work equally attractive uh, in the virtual space as in the real and, uh, and things like education. Uh, Rob, um, Robert Nozick um, wrote about the idea of an experience machine, which I think sort of can inform and does relate to the metaverse idea, except that it's a very much a, as far as I understand the original um, description of it was very much just one person per experience machine. It's not like a collective thing. But um, look, the, the metaverse may evolve in that sort of direction. Um, so, but let me ask you a, a couple of provoking questions. Is experience all that matters? Can we have meaning in, in an experience machine oriented metaverse? Um, and if so, will experience machines be all that we need to cater for our, all our needs? And of course, it, it sounds like, you know, if we have that level of technology, it will be cheaper to, to keep everybody in experience machines. I mean, I, I, yeah, what do you think? What do you think about like a Robin Hansen's idea of the um, having you know M's and that we all will all migrate possibly to um, a virtual reality? Well, two uh, two recommendations, and then I'll give you a thought about that. Um, first, the the Nozick essay in Anarchy, State, and Utopia um, about the experience machine is fascinating. You should read that. But you should also read Jonathan Glover's short book, What Sort of People Should There Be? Written in 1979, I read it in 82. And it, was re it really started me on the path of uh, future technology philosophy because in very short essays, he takes apart key issues that we're still debating today, human genetic engineering enhancement, mood modification and the experience machine. He has three uh, short essays about the experience machine. And he says, well, is the problem with the experience machine is that there aren't consequences to your actions, you know, that you can keep dying and coming back to life. That could be fixed. You, if that's the problem, we could fix that. Is the problem in the metaverse that you don't have real friends, that you're not really communicating with people? Well, that's not even the metaverse that we're talking about anymore right? It's not like you're just going to be a head in a box talking to yourself. It's going to be that you're going to be a head in a box talking to everybody else who's a head in a box. So you're going to be talking to real people. Um, and he goes through these, 
these complaints that people have with the idea of an experience machine and uh, abuses them. Now, I think that that is an excellent essay and it convinced me that the experience machine is not the kind of problem that I thought it was. However, um, I still have, just as I have uh, my aversion to being unemployed myself, at least until I turned 67, um, uh, I still have an aversion to the idea of everybody doing everything in the virtual and nothing in the real. I don't want to see that kind of future. And uh, the next recommendation I have is Ada Palmer's very challenging, but still very stimulating, uh, Terra Ignota novels, which she just finished with the fourth novel. And it turns out that one of the central debates that she imagines, this is set 500 years from now, one of the central issues that she imagines driving conflict in that future society is that the future kind of, there, there are a number of different kinds of transhumanism in the future, but one, one kind of transhumanism are the people who want to explore the stars. And another kind is who the ones who want mood modification and uh, virtual reality. And, you know, they, they want to improve life on earth. And you, they want to improve life on earth to the extent that probably no one will want to explore the stars because exploring the stars is hard. Um, and the farther you're away, you know, until we solve faster than light travel and communication, the farther you're away from the rest of us, the more we're going to pull apart as a species. And so they introduce all these problems. Anyway, I thought that was great for her to imagine this kind of fundamental question that some have posed also in terms of the Fermi paradox. It's like, if you, if you look around at the universe and you say, where is everybody? And you think, well, maybe it's that you get to a certain level of technology and those levels of technology are just so dangerous that you almost invariably blow yourself up. That's one solution to the Fermi paradox. I think a far more prosaic one is you get to a certain level of technology and you figure out how to do mood modification and virtual reality, and you don't want to do anything else anymore. <laughs> you know, you're perfectly content in the land of the lotus eaters for the rest of your existence. And I don't want that kind of future either. So I think there are some legitimate concerns in this direction and ways to kind of balance this. Um, but I, you know, I, my wife keeps pulling me out for walks in the woods. So uh, I think as long as there are people like her, uh, the people like me probably won't take us to the land of the lotus eaters. So someone in the audience asked, to what extent might the post-automation employment um, topography express a status symbol hierarchy? Um, and he goes on to elaborate that people who own lots of stuff hiring humans to do work that the masses rely on automation for as an expression of status. And in turn, um, creating a middle class of service industry um, servicing the rich who in turn, despite being servants, have greater status than the masses of unemployed. So another recommendation, um, Cory Doctorow, who I'm sure everyone is familiar with um, and who is a fantastic um, at writing novels that intervene in these debates. Um, his novel, for the win, which is argues that the international uh, online work that people are going to do in the metaverse means that we have to have international online methods of labor organizing, which I think is brilliant. I also have a son who is the staffer of the Emergency Workplace Organizing Committee, which is an online project that has connected hundreds of trained labor organizers with thousands of shops around the country who do not have unions and who write to them and say, look, we have a, a labor problem. Can you put us in touch with somebody who can be, you know, train us on what to do in this situation? And I think that's precisely what we need as we, as the labor movement declines and so forth. Corey also wrote a book about 3D printing and its potential impact. You know, half of all of the US economy, the industrialized economies is based on the, manufacture, the, the mining, manufacturing, transportation, and sale of physical tangible objects. And if you start to imagine an economy in which you just come up with a plan and it gets beamed out to people's matter printers and everybody, and there's no more truckers and there's no more stores, you know, et cetera, you're gonna have a lot of unemployment. And, and so he wrote that novel 12 years ago. But he, one of his first novels was Down and Out in the Magic Kingdom. 
um, which was about a future society. I forget how many years in the future, but uh, it was set at Disney World. And uh, it was about the politics between the different anarchist collectives running the different rides at Disney World. But that in that future, people, uh, the economy was a post-scarcity, post-materialist economy. But um, if you wanted more access to stuff, or I, I forget what, how people spent their woofies, but he, he had this economy called woofies. And it was basically a little thing that if you, whenever you looked at somebody, you could see how many woofies they had. Um, and they got more woofies if your software appreciated what they were doing. And you, they lost woofies if you didn't like them. So I, a lot of people were intrigued by this. This is kind of reputation economy uh, that was kind of automated. Uh, Gary Steinhardt also wrote a novel in which the horrific, really horrific consequences of that, like if you were going around and constantly being raided by everybody and becoming poor. Also, there was a Black Mirror episode where a woman loses all of her woofies and she can't get on a bus. Nosedive. Uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. It was hilarious, so, but it's really, really, yeah, this time. It's re too. really, really scary. And of course, the Chinese social credit, Sesame social credit score system is headed in this direction as well, where you lose points on your social credit and then won't be able to get a loan or go to college or get a visa. Uh, if you if your friends said something critical about Xi Jinping online, then you lose credits. Anyway, the Wuffy system was so controversial. Then in um, Walk uh, Walk Away, his novel uh, novel he published like three years ago, he um, basically comes up with a post scare a truly post scarcity non economic uh, utopian vision. And the reactionaries are the ones who are proposing the reputation economy Wuffies. Um, Okay, the reason I bring this up is because I don't think we're gonna get away from status. And um, I think that a, a society in which some, and, and this also relates to the debate over meritocracy, that in the first place, none of our societies are as meritocratic as we think they are, um, because wealth is always generating, you know, your class origin is always doing some work to generate your class destination. But, um, uh, uh, even a truly meritocratic society in which uh, most people can't uh, get access to the high status jobs would be a kind of inequality in society. And someone who's written on this is The Beggars in Spain by Nancy Kress, that, that trilogy. She has 90% of the population is unemployed and living off the dole. And only 10%, the human enhanced 10%, get the true high status jobs that are still available. And um, I think even though we're not there yet, this is part of what's driving the crisis of Western democracy because working class people uh, used to have access to longstanding jobs and careers with unions that could make a living and provide for their families. And now there's such economic insecurity and the people who have security are the college educated workers who look down on the blue collar workers and say, you're not woke, you're not, you're not worthy, you're too stupid, uh, or at least that's the way they feel. Whether they're actually doing it or not, that's the way it feels. And the working class, the former working class parties or parties that appeal to working class interests are now dominated by woke college educated people who uh, are culturally incompatible, let's say, with the, with the blue collar people. So the blue collar people are then going over to Trump and the far right. This is a central dynamic of what's happening in the crisis of Western democracy. So, um, and this is also central to this meritocratic idea. We need to address whether uh, giving everyone free college education, which is, I, I support as a demand, but I'm a college university. You know, I'm a university administrator. Of course, I'm going to support that everyone should have a voucher to come to my institution. Um, I'm trying to sell them on the idea of meritocracy. Come to my institution, get this credential, and you'll have a great life afterwards. Not like those people working at McDonald's. Um, we need to address whether that's the kind of society we want to live in, or only going to that institution behind me gives you a decent chance of life. Yes. Okay. Someone asks, will the pay gap? Okay. Um, 
this person who's asking, I don't know whether I'm meant to, uh, he wants me to say his name, hooray. Uh, <laughs> sorry, hooray. But yes, he asked, he's from Africa actually, he, he asked, will the pay gap between third world and developed world be bridged in the metaverse. Post COVID saw lots of online work for people in Africa, but the pay gap is still the same. He used to work at yeah. OpenCog. We met each other like in Hong Kong, I think. Well, I think there's a couple of things with the kind of development economics aspect of this. One is that, you know, if you go back to Marx, um, and you just the, read the Communist Manifesto, short read. Um, they loved global capitalism because global capitalism was going to knit the world together and create common interests among all the people of the world. And it was going to eventually create common economic development around the world. Um, and that eventually became a developmentalist economic model that said that embraced the idea that as uh, industrialized countries became more sophisticated and their workers became more educated and more expensive, that industrial jobs would begin to move to the global south and that that same process would happen in the global south. And eventually we'd all end up with very little agriculture and very little industry and mostly doing service jobs or, or no jobs. Um, and I think that that kind of a future uh, is now called into question by automation because what we're seeing in places like China, I mean, China, the, there's already a crisis in China because demands for labor are pushing factories that used to find China a cheap source of labor, pushing them to Vietnam or other, kind, other parts of the world that have cheaper labor. But we're also seeing that automation and robotics in some of those societies in the industrialized world and in the developing world um, are reducing the possibility of that kind of development model. And um, so I think that's gonna be a problem, but there's also then the, pro the, the dynamics of the concentration of things in a place, which is that there is a, uh, an increase in productivity that has been that is measurable when you have people together in a city, but also when you have like-minded, uh, when you have an ecology in a geographic space of similar kinds of activities. So Silicon Valley is an example. The biotech innovations that are happening around Boston because of Harvard and MIT and the other universities there. And you see similar things, you know, Bollywood, there's, there's similar kinds of ecologies of local uh, concentration of stuff. That's hard for countries to overcome. I mean, if you, if you say, uh, you know, if you're Tunisia and you say, we wanna have a Silicon Valley, let's uh, start funding people to do Silicon Valley stuff. It's like, great, but still, you know, going to Silicon Valley is gonna be a thousand times more productive and your possibility of, of selling to the world is gonna be a thousand times greater. So I think there's a number of different reasons why the developing world um, is in trouble because of the breakdown of this developmentalist model. I think, it, I think that's the question. Do you think that, did I answer that question? I often have to ask this when I'm teaching. I get, a, I get into a, a stream of consciousness and then I wake up half a minute later and it's like, did I answer your question? Well, I mean, I'll let Ray um, answer whether you've answered the question if he wants to. <laughs> but anyway, the question is in the chat. Um, okay. Okay. So, uh, right. <laughs> Somehow, yes. Okay, good. That's good enough. Okay, cool. Right. Uh, so someone mentioned um, whether you know, 3D printers, matter printers detach us from a need for transportation um, and commented that you need an education in 3D printing materials and their manufacture and distribution. Well, that's one of the many problems with that vision. Another is that as long as we live in a private property or, and specifically an intellectual property regime, I mean, as long as you have to buy materials for the machine, buy the machine, keep it maintenance maintained and pay for the templates that you use to print stuff, 
you're still part of capitalism. And, um, you know, w when we had uh, Napster and the beginnings of file sharing for music and movies and television, um, that's like three, four percent of the U.S. economy. People went crazy and uh, proposed laws. You know, you're going to go to jail for five years if you share this movie with somebody online. Um, and the European Union has terrible laws on this and all around the world. So it, then if you imagine a situation where half of all economic activity is happening in an intellectual property domain and the, the consequences of people freely sharing templates to make stuff, yeah, you, but then it also gets back to the status question. You could freely share, a te you know, right now you, there are certain things that you, you, you could, download how to 3D print a car and make and do that if you want. But would you rather do that or would you rather own a Tesla? You know, most people would rather own a Tesla than something they had to 3D print themselves. So um, I think the central question is going to still be um, whether we can make access to things that people want more equally distributed. And those things that people want are going to be constantly evolving. So it's not, it's not just gonna be making sure that every, everyone's fed. It's also gonna be making sure that if, uh, you know, if, if your kid wants the latest toy um, and only the children of the rich can get the latest toy, is there a way that we could make the latest toy more accessible to everybody? And that's not a matter of survival. Hopefully it won't be a matter of survival, but it will be a matter of equity. If we want to plan a fully automated luxury communism or socialism or whatever you want to call it, um, knowing what people will want in the future um, might be useful if, we, if we're going to do anything concrete. Have you got any ideas about what people will want, um, you know, in another 20 years or 50 years or however long it takes to fully automate everything once we have you know a mature automation what do you think will be the largest drivers in in um the evolution of what people want will people just want like you know um i guess experience buttons they can press anytime that they want you know or orgasm button or some sort of like a roller coaster ride button or you know why you're anticipating part the of my, my thought there. Yeah. I mean, in the first place, um, there's a great book that everyone should pick up, People's Republic of Walmart, because it makes the argument, it, ta it reviews the socialist calculation debate about why planned economies in the 20th century were unable to make people as wealthy and, and make economies work as well as market economies. Um, and it argues that when you look at Walmart, which is bigger as an economy globally, bigger as an economy than like 150 different countries. Um, and you look at this integrated production chain that they've created around the world and the technologies for knowing where everything is. Then on top of that, they have created predictive algorithms so that if there's gonna be a big football game in Peoria, Illinois, and whenever there's a big football game, everybody eats a bunch of chips and has to buy a bunch of toilet paper, then we need to stock up on toilet paper before the big games. The, you know, those kinds of predictive algorithms. Um, then you can begin to imagine out of that what uh, a 21st century planned economy might look like um, or as much planning as people need and want um, that would get the stuff where it needs to be when people it. Now, the problem with that kind of, even that kind of planning, which I do think is going to be possible, is that uh, it's very difficult to predict um, people's desires. You know, people's desires for stuff, you, you may predict that they want uh, toilet paper, but um, would you predict that because they of a pandemic, that everyone's going to freak out about toilet paper and you're actually going to need 10 times as much toilet paper. Who could have predicted that? That, that was going to be the thing people were going to freak out about. Um, and so predictive analytics is very difficult to do in a planned economy. And part of the virtues and part of the downside of free market capitalism is that there are constantly people trying to make a buck 
by selling you on wanting new things. And that has the disadvantage that maybe we don't need some of those new things and we could do with fewer things, but it has the advantage of people constantly trying to come up with new things that they could sell you. And I have a lot of gadgets. So, you know, I would, I would feel a little bit uh, poorer if there wasn't a world with more gadgets. So I think we always have to have a balance between uh, innovative market mechanisms that will do, I think, for the time being, that better than artificial intelligence. Now, if we get to the point where artificial intelligence can look inside everybody's brains and say, I know you haven't even thought about this yet, but I think what you really would, might want is X, um, then all bets are off. You know, that, then, then, as Eli Yudkowsky once said, what we don't want is a, a robot to give us all what we want. We want the robot god to figure out what we really need and only give us that. Okay, well, if we get there, fine. But the other part that you addressed in your question, which is the only real way a post-scarcity society works in my mind, is if people start pushing those buttons in their brain. In other words, because desire is limitless, um, the only way that we could get to a society where there's no more conflict over stuff is if we change people's desire for stuff and make it possible to make people happy having less stuff or the same amount of stuff. And that's not really a utopian vision, in my opinion. I think that's, um, that's a prescription for stasis, but it could also be a prescription for a green world because then we could get everybody not to want more stuff, and wouldn't have to destroy much, as much of the planet. I guess a lot of people do want um, scarce things. They want, you know, uh, they want like uh, things that other people don't have just because they don't have it. People like the idea of scarcity if they can have access to the scarce things, but they don't like the idea of scarcity if they don't. Um, is this a problem with the human condition? Uh, you know, is this something in, in which we, a way in which we can be sort of morally or, or uh, I guess, um, value enhanced so that we don't require scarce, scarce things in order to be happy. Jim Clark, sorry if I, you didn't want me to say your name, Jim, but um, oh, hi, Jim. He, Good he, to asked, see you. he asked, perhaps people will want this scarcity um, and that whiskey is available uh, in most places and good whiskey is available at a reasonable cost, but some people buy the $80,000 bottle, right? Because they can say, hey, Look how rich I am. Just look at this amazing rare bottle of whiskey. Maybe it'll be vodka next, right? Russian vodka will be worth like $80,000 a bottle. There's a great study of the um, British who's who from the 19th century to the present. And in that who's who, people basically write their own biographical sketch and they highlight different parts of their personality. And in the 19th century, they're far more likely to say things like, you know, fox hunting and hanging out at my villa in the woods and blah, blah, blah. And in the mid 20th century, they started saying things like reading, walking with my wife, you know, things like that. Because in different times and places, ostentatious wealth and status seeking of that kind is seen as as gross, you know, it, it lowers your social prestige rather than increases it. Um, I hope that in our future society, it will be seen as gross to be ostentatious in certain ways. But even if it's not, um, yeah, I think there's always going to be status differences. I mean, think about Star Trek. Um, the, the people make a big deal out of the fact that Picard pointed out to, I think, one of the cons that in now in the future, we don't care about money anymore. Everybody has everything they need, except a lot of people want to be in Starfleet. They want to be able to travel around the universe and meet new species and kill interesting things. Um, so I think uh, there's still going to be status even in the most post-scarcity society. I think that's probably an inescapable, and, unless we change human nature, unless we make everybody part of the Borg and nobody cares anymore. But as long as we're basically programmed primates, or as long as we're primates and not programmed, um, I think we're gonna still have status hierarchies. And if they're based on what your contr potential occupational contribution is, um, I think that's better than other things. I mean, game theoretically, it seems as though um, to me that 
status and uh, the, the the want of things sort of uh, rare is useful. Um, I guess like you know, if if you've if you've got status because you have lots of something that other people just don't have, it also usually means that you've got some kind of power. Um, and people, you know, if it really means you do have power because you've got all those um, resources, or if it's just a hegemony thing. So uh, hopefully, like we'll be able to, uh, as you say, perhaps um, sort of uh, maybe take that will for for just control or power out of it, out of ourselves through um, a sort of moral enhancement. Well, yeah, just, how do you think this point... thing will pl play out game theoretically? Well, just on that future. point, one of the reasons I've always been a post-Marxist is, instead of a Marxist, is that I have a Weberian understanding of power, and you put your finger on it. Uh, Marx thought all power derived from wealth, and Weber said, no, no, status and political power can also be forms of power, it's not just wealth. Um, and the way I usually frame it for students is like, if I have a gun, I can get wealth and, and get you to do what I want you to do. If I have wealth and you and the people with guns and the people who can convince you to do what I want you to do want wealth, then I can get them to help me get you to do what I want you to do. But if I can just convince you to do things, then I can get wealth and guns. So these three forms of power are fungible in a society. I don't see one as being more primary than the other. Um, and this means that the kinds of oppression that we face are have ideological components and they have force components and they have material components. But okay, setting that aside, I don't see that changing anytime soon. I think that that fundamental dynamic, uh, again, me, assuming we don't change human nature, but uh, as long as we have Three kinds of power. And the question is how to create as much equal distribution of those three kinds of power in society as possible. Someone from the audience is asking that, um, well, is work an embedded nature that defines us as humans and should we get rid of that? Um, well, uh, that gets back to this human nature question. I think it's quite as I've said at the beginning, I think that, um, you know, the idea that you have to do wage work for a wage in order to have a meaningful life is a relatively recent one. For most women, it is even more recent because, you know, the idea of at least the, the man working outside the home is more of a 19th century kind of invention. But, you know, most peasants, uh, they had a different relationship to work and the land and subsistence and so forth, and then not to mention hunter gatherers. So, for most of whatever humans are, whatever for most of human existence, people did not believe in paid labor. They didn't even have the concept. Um, but the idea that we could then transition uh, culturally without changing human nature to a society in which people no longer, in which the expectation is that we just keep everybody alive. They don't have to necessarily do anything. I think that that is still a possibility. We could, as we gradually expand the, what I call the social wage, the wage that you get just for being a human being, as we expand that free healthcare, free medicine, free education, uh, et cetera, and a UBI, um, we could eventually have a tipping point where um, you know, so we just accept that some people want to work and some people don't, and that's okay. Um, but uh, short of that, we are also in parallel going to be developing neurotechnologies. And if you're a conspiracy minded person, I think there's always been this anxiety that, well, why did we legalize cannabis now? You know, <laughs> we, we, legal, we legalized cannabis in Massachusetts and Connecticut and a number of California and other states around the United States. And I think cannabis should be legalized. But, uh, you know, my experience of cannabis as a teenager was that it was, it made it very easy to be comfortable not doing anything. And um, it, it may be that, you know, we will find, uh, whether through conspiracy or just because it becomes the drug of choice, uh, drugs which make us not really care that we're not accomplishing anything.
I guess so. So, um, in abstract, what can people be doing? What can the average person be doing now to um, to bias a livelihood that will achieve a uh, a good form of, uh, I guess, automation, automated future, a good form of basic income or basic, um, yeah, universal basic needs, uh, yeah, fulfillment. Well, there are educational things that you can do. There's lots being written about this topic, all the way from the corporate press, you know, Deloitte has some wonderful things about the future of work and the impacts of automation. Um, you know, uh, people who think, here's how you can make a profit. Here's how you can invest stocks to benefit from a future without work. Um, to people who are concerned about the policy implications, people who, are, who want to have politics that is centered on this idea. Um, and I have been, of course, because of my political commitments, I've been very focused on what the left and the socialist left has been thinking about these questions. And there are little glimmers here and there. Um, uh, before and during Corbyn, there were a group in the British Labour Party that um, were, had adopted the fully automated luxury communism kind of vision of a post-work politics. Um, and, there, and there were a lot of debates about that. And I was like, great, let's, let's have a real debate. Let's start figuring out um, how we can start selling this to the working class, you know, that we all get, want to get rid of our jobs. Um, but I don't really think that has emerged yet. And the political challenges and economic challenges that we face don't really yet sustain an anti-work politics. But um, it does sustain, uh, it still has always sustained a politics that is generous in terms of the social welfare state. Um, and especially as we confront the old age dependency problem, I think we're poised for a series of converging crises that will uh, make us face this UBI, whether UBI and universal, in the United States, universal healthcare. But what sense does it make that we only provide universal health care for senior citizens and not for children and not for uh, working adults. But at any rate, the idea that um, you know working uh, adults should be impoverished in order to pay taxes to support pensioners, I think that that's going to be politically un unsustainable. Generational conflict will be unsustainable. And so we need to revamp the whole system of social welfare provision. And that's one of the reasons why I think we're going to be uh, returning to UBI. And I think that will be a central political question about how we go to UBI and how generous it should be. But um, I don't think there's quite the, um, uh, and you know, things are changing so fast, maybe next week, that's when, <laughs> when the politics will change and there suddenly be a global constituency for an anti-work politics, but we're not quite there yet. Um, so, and I think there are a lot of other artificial intelligence related questions. Um, how quickly should we allow artificial intelligence to uh, displace workers and who should be paying for the costs? There's these kind of proposals to tax automation. If, it, you know, if you identify that this particular kind of automation is gonna drive this number of workers out of work, then you have to pay a tax and the, those workers get retrained or supported in some other way, whatever. Those proposals are out there. So there's a lot of, kind of timing and um, uh, uh, how to respond to the automation crisis, but not very much enthusiasm yet for eliminating work as a political project. Um, is there any bandwidth that IWET has for people who want to um, help out with the Future of Work project that you guys are engaged in? Well, I'd like to hear people's thoughts about this. Um, the IET used to have email lists where we would talk about our different projects. We had an email list for science fiction and the visions of the future project, we called it. We had an email list about catastrophic rights, uh, strata, catastrophic risks. <coughs> and we had an email list for human enhancement news. And then we had our website where we uh, it was, had a blog and um, a lot of 
the community building was done in the comment sections of the blog. Um, we have shifted our web, all the blogging to the platform Medium, which has some advantages that we like. Um, but we've gotten, you know, a fraction of the traction that we used to with the blog that we had on our website. Yeah, all the young people tell me that email's dead and that they don't want to subscribe to any more email lists and, um, and I believe them. So email doesn't seem to be the thing. Um, I have tried Slack, hate it. Uh, every Slack channel I've ever joined died after some period of time. People have suggested uh, uh, subreddits, you know, I, I just don't know how to where the and what the modality of building this kind of online community should be. But, you know, I'm my wife calls me the research assistant to the world because I love nothing more than scanning the news and saying, oh, so and so needs to see this and so and so needs to see this. And I used to do a lot of that with the IET uh, community and, and that would help generate conversations. And I just don't know how to do that anymore. Um, but uh, if but please do uh, subscribe. We have a Facebook group. We have a Twitter feed and we have a medium channel, a medium magazine where uh, we you can be published, if you in the audience. Um, if you create a free medium account, write a blog piece and just send it to us, we can evaluate it for publication there. And, um, and of course there are the capacity to have comments in, those, uh, in that blog site, medium. Uh, but I, I, I don't think we've hit on the, the new killer app for building IET's community around this stuff. Otherwise, we are going to be recording. We're having a talk tomorrow. John Danaher is giving a talk about um, his book uh, about automation and utopia. Um, and he's- Oh yeah, I've brilliant. interviewed him on that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll pass the interview to you so you can, yeah, speak to John him as well. He's great. Fantastic thinker. He makes me feel like a piker. And so, yeah, always love to hear his thoughts. Um, but he's, uh, he's going to talk tomorrow online Zoom meeting. It's, we're doing it in a webinar. We just had one with Anders Sandberg and it got Zoom bombed, which um, is my a first for me. So we're going to do tomorrow's as a webinar, um, but we're going to be recording it as we did Anders talk. And we also had a recent talk with Kevin Legrander about um, work and automation. And then uh, in two weeks, we're going to have uh, Rita Kadri from MIT and she's been working on the effects of platform work, uh, digital platform work on worker solidarity, which is uh, something that our new fellow is gonna be addressing as well, Alex Stubbs. So then we record those and we put them in our channel. There's a IET YouTube channel and a uh, YouTube channel for AEC, the uh, Applied Ethics Center. Well, you've also got Jet Press. Do you still do much of that? Um... Okay, well, Jet Press, way back when it started, 98, it was the Journal of Transhumanism. And then we decided, well, we'd like people who don't necessarily consider themselves transhumanists to publish in this journal. Um, and uh, to do that, it had to have the word transhumanism taken out. So we started, uh, we, we renamed it in 2000, 2001, to uh, Journal of Evolution and Technology. And it had a great run. Um, and then when we got this new grant and started working on these new projects, we thought uh, uh, Russell Blackford had been the editor for like a decade of, of Journal of Evolution and Technology and he has his publishing career has taken off. Um, so he needed to step back. We thought this is a perfect time for us to uh, revamp this journal and professionalize it. And um, our managing director, Steve Umbrello, who's just published a book as well, by the way, about um, lethal autonomous robotics. Um, Steve is a serious European scholar and um, uh, the original culture around our journal had been, we just wanna get these ideas out. Everybody should free, see them. We, we don't have any interest in being published by a, a major publishing company. We just want a website where we can put up our academic ideas. Um, but Steve's like, look, we really want people to publish with us. There has to be DOIs. There has to be the identifiers that this is a serious academic journal. We have to start getting ranked in the academic journal you know, uh, metrics and so forth. So we've revamped again 
The new journal is called the Journal of, Ev of uh, Ethics and Emerging Technologies. It's at jeet.iet.org. And um, we just published two editions. I have an article in there about intelligent tutoring machines and the deprofessionalization of teaching, which I have never, you know, even though my day job is as a university administrator, I never applied my futurology to uh, the domain of education before. And I found it very stimulating. Um, but it, one of the things that I found interesting is that you know, usually in the discussions about automation, people say there are certain skills and certain kinds of occupations that um, will never be automated, and and teaching is one of them. It's like really, let's take a look at that um, because one of the th novels that was very influential to me was Diamond Age by Neil Stevenson, in which the central technology is an artificial uh, tutoring technology that um, has this transformative effect on a young Chinese girl's life. And, um, and I always liked that idea that you could program an AI to identify in, through conversation and through general knowledge of, of a child, the thing that, you know, they're interested in dinosaurs, great. We can teach them about the entire world through the perspective of dinosaurs. You wanna know about dinosaur ecology, you wanna know about dinosaur biology, you wanna know about dinosaur social relations, we do the whole thing. And I thought that that was a fantastic understanding of what, how we get away from the factory model of education that we inherited from 19th century or the medieval model of higher education that we inherited from you know, the 12th century um, and have a really 21st century, highly personalized artificial intelligence based um, pedagogical model. So at any rate, uh, that essay is uh, up at jeet.iet.org. Let's see, Nicholas Taleb talks about the growth in unequal power takes all industries, i.e. most uh, songwriters pay to be a songwriter and only a few make all the money. Are we looking perhaps at that type of future who will own the automotive industries? <coughs> well, unequal winner takes all industries. I mean, the internet's already kind of exacerbated that. Um, my institution, again, the one behind me, um, We've been talking about making more aggressive moves into online education for a while, but um, there are some established players in online education, most of whom have higher prestige than we do. And, um, and because of economies of scale are able to provide uh, online education cheaper for free. So there, I think that's gonna be the case in a lot of places in a, a pre-internet age. Um, education is something that you had to do face to face and therefore there was real premium on going to a local uh, an institution that was within driving or walking distance of where you were. But if we start competing globally on the internet for online education, then everybody's gonna want the Harvard, you know, the free MOOC from Harvard uh, certificate instead of the local community college online certificate. So I think um, the internet has changed some of the global, and this gets back to the question about service industries is that, um, you know, yes, theoretically, we now have a global competition and downward pressure on, on wages globally because of competition with uh, people in the developing world. But uh, there may be other prestige advantages that um, make that not the case. But I, I don't know, Jim, are you still, yeah, you're still here. Jim, you wanna say something about your question? Sorry, just let me unmute myself. Um, yeah, I, I guess what, what I was kind of driving at was, you know, what, what Taleb's talking about is, you know, we have, we have kind of industries that have always been kind of winner takes all, like maybe, you know, being a Hollywood actor as opposed to, but, but even there, there were things like, um, you know, every, every city used to have its little theater troupe that, you know, so there were still jobs where you could kind of get to a certain level. But Taleb's kind of, I forget which book it, it is, he talks about it, but he, he's talking about the, this model where, you know, previously, you know, if you're a vet in Zimbabwe, if you're a vet in America, you're earning different wages, but you kind of have the same 
relative level of, of, of lifestyle and, and affluence for the context in which you find yourself in. Like, so, so it's quite it's semi-equal. But he's saying that, that, that this winner-takes-all voraciousness, this kind of hyper-capitalist voraciousness, is, um, is kind of eating up more and more industries. Uh, so that now, I mean, kind of what you're saying yourself, the internet's exacerbated this. Um, you know, uh, it's kind of like um, we see it in, 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 in all the creative arts, I think, for a start. We, we're, we're seeing it increasingly in, in different, uh, you know, tech spheres as well. You know, I, I'm old enough, maybe you are too, to remember, you know, Web 1.0 when we all kind of designed our own HTML websites and stuff. And, and now everybody's on, you know, chasing whichever platform is, is, is of the day. You know, it was Facebook, but that's for old people. So now it's TikTok, you know, it, once upon a time it was Bebo. Um, you know, there's, there's this tremendous like kind of rush uh, in, into areas and, and then all the money rushes into a very small number of pockets. You know, this is why, you know, Jeff Bezos and, and, and Elon Musk and these people are made billions, hundreds of billions out of, uh, out of the pandemic period and everybody else got bigger. Yeah, I think another part of that dynamic is that people say, you know, automation for a lot of jobs, it just um, gives you a, the ability to extend your work. Like, you know, a doctor um, using um, telemedicine to uh, monitor uh, 10 different ICUs. And it's like, yeah, uh, it doesn't put that doctor out of work. It may give them actually extra work and extra income. But what it puts out of work is all the other 10 doctors that you used to have to hire to sit in those ICUs. Now, now you just have one doctor who's monitoring 10 ICUs. So, yeah, I think that this is a rather pervasive uh, phenomenon that um, even in situations where there's an uh, inescapable human component, there's a concentration of work to the few. And you see that with, you know, the websites. There are some websites that, you know, Pornhub. <laughs> which just, Pornhub just uh, blocked all Russian users of Pornhub. So uh, I'm, I'm cool with Pornhub today. But, uh, well, you know, they, there's- They certain... didn't, unfortunately. They were banned there already, but it's, you know- Oh, really? We're, 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 in, an, we're in an era of misinformation, so, but it's okay, nice to good. think so. <laughs> but there are certain websites that suck up, you know, 99% of all the traffic on the internet and the rest of us are left with the dregs. So yeah, it's a uh, pervasive phenomenon, but I don't think that that's the kind of egalitarianism that I necessarily want to see a policy to address. You know, I, I think that's going to be more or less inevitable, you know, that there's going to be very popular things and less popular things, but. So um, we maybe super we're need a way to regulate the, you know, because if we get this density of uh, power to use your, Weberian model, you know, um, yeah, yeah. wealth, power, influence, you know, mm -hmm. um, we need to find some way of regulating that, no? Right. Well, yes. I mean, clearly the influence of the tech titans over democratic processes is one of the things that we've been trying to figure out how to regulate. Adam and I had a prior conversation today in which we talked about um, how you identify fake news, you know, the the hegemony. And this is I mean, every time Trump signs on to a new technology endeavor, it immediately crashes and burns. So I'm not terribly worried about this, but they did have Fox News and still have Fox News. So, you know, the fact that 40% of Americans get all their news from this incredible, you know, ridiculous source um, is a huge problem for the United States. And some, you can say the same thing about Facebook and Twitter and Google, et cetera. So um, I do think that there is a problem, but I just don't, I don't know what the solutions are for that particular problem yet. I mean, it, I should it, just to go back to my online education example. I, you know, how would you tell students? No, you're not allowed to take a MOOC at Harvard. You have to take it at your local community college. Yeah. There has to be some form of of added added value to it. Are you, uh, and are I you in know, Ireland? I don't know what that is. Hmm? Are you are you in Ireland, Jim? I'm I'm from Ireland, but I'm in Italy right now. Oh, you're in Italy. Okay. Well, talking about work in Italy, it's interesting. <laughs> what do you What do you think the conversation is in Italy about uh, these things? So, uh, would the Italians be ready to sign on to an anti-work or post-work agenda? Well, well, I mean, it, they 
I'm, I'm right in the south of Italy, so they have a, you know, I think a very healthy approach to work. You know, we, you know, everything shuts down in the afternoon. They have the siesta, um, you know, and, and obviously there's a long tradition here of, of emigration to, to earn money in higher, you know, uh, income locations on the planet and then maybe come back. And, and we've seen that kind of proliferate, but they were kind of one of the early adopters of that, you know. I was reading last night about kind of, you know, the... Um, the, 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 the kind of organized crime syndicates of the 1930s. And of course, you know, they were all from around here. I'm, I'm right down in the tip of Puglia. So, um, wow. you know, they've been doing this for a couple of hundred years, migrating to different places, including the North, which, I mean, they consider Milan to be Germany here. Um, you know, so um, they have a sense that, yeah, so, to a certain extent, work is, work is elsewhere. I mean, the things that they do here, you know, and they'll go out at 5 a.m. and work in the field, you know, but that's, it, it, it's kind of not work. It's kind of just something that you do. It's your own land. It's, you're doing it with your family, with your friends. You do it whatever hours you want to do it. You stop when it gets hot, you go have a beer. Um, but this kind of like nine to five or nine to whenever, you know, um, online kind of scenario, um, that that's something that kind of you do online or elsewhere. Yeah, it's not. I mean, but this culture will be eroded too. What do you think eroded by what and how? By by being in the same world as everywhere else. You know, um, they've just gone through a pandemic where all the kids had to learn online, uh, adapt to that. So <clears throat> it was a culture three years ago where the kids are out in the streets. It's kind of like, you know, gray haired people like me talk about the, or, or even older than me talk about, oh, when I was a kid, we used to be out in the streets all day long till it was midnight kind of thing. Um, it was still like that here three years ago. Um, now it's not because they've adapted via the, the need to be online for, for pandemic era education to the idea of being online all the damn time. Mm hmm. So, I think that's yeah, an interesting changed. point. The, the agricultural economy where people have a plot of land that gives them some independence from the market economy, um, you know, that of course was key to the uh, creation of modern industrial capitalism, the enclosures and the severing people's relationship to the land. And I think that relates to the vision of a post-scarcity society where we might have the ability to maybe not grow stuff, but print stuff or make stuff in our own house. I don't know if anybody's heard of uh, Andre Gortz, but Andre Gortz uh, back in the 80s imagined that we were headed towards technological unemployment. He was a, a French uh, labor theorist. And, he, and his vision of what an ideal society would be was basically publicly funded um, uh, uh, shops where you could go and use publicly owned tools to make anything you wanted. So, you know, you instead of having to go and buy your own snow blower, you could go and, you know, take the community snow blower and use it on your land and take it back. And my grandfathers actually were both farmers and um, they both uh, lost their shirts because they wanted to own their own equipment instead of using the local agricultural cooperatives equipment, in which case they would have been farmers for another decade, maybe. But um, so I do think that there's, I think there's something there about the, and the community building that goes on when people have the stability of their own plot of land and but yet can cooperate on collective endeavors, as opposed to the the kind of Marx had this vision that you that once workers were all lined up in a big factory, you know, an integrated industrial process, that that was what generated class consciousness. But the kind of Jeffersonian democratic ideal is uh, a nation of of small landowners that co cooperate on uh, liberal democracy and individual freedom and things like that. And I think there's it's some place in between, you know, what the kind of future I want. Yeah. I, th I think there's a, I don't want to hog too much. I know there's another question, but um, I, I think there's, we were talking about status earlier. You know, I think there's a certain stat. I mean, if, 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 if I want to go to the supermarket and buy some, some produce, um, you know, it, it'll probably be cheaper than if I go and buy it off the guy who pulled it out of his, 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 his farm this morning and is selling it by the roadside. And, and possibly they're kind of the same quality, but uh, it feels better to buy it off that guy and it tastes better psychologically. I'm probably deluding myself, but it, you know, so it has that, 
that value of scarcity because he's only produced so much and I can I, and the human interaction and so on and I wonder you know maybe somewhere in there there's 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 an answer to this of giving people the autonomy and the 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 the, the dignity of of their own kind of um, ability to generate that little bit of extra income and, and provide value to each other. My wife's an art professor and a ceramicist. And so I think about this question a lot. It's like, you know, the ability to mass produce kitchenware didn't mean that people weren't, uh, didn't have a market for uh, handcrafted ceramics anymore. In fact, um, it may have improved the market. You know, there, there, we were rich enough that we could start buying these little objet art that we wanted in our house. Um, and so th that also, I think, relates to the, the prestige question. And maybe one of the kinds of prestige is that you were able to acquire this limited, you know, handcrafted thing that, yeah, you could get it, you know, for free. You could print it yourself in your house if you wanted to. But somebody made this one, you know, with their hands. I think that that could be a, a, a basis of a certain kind of economy in the future. I don't know how big that part of economy could ever be, but it could be part of it. Yeah. Excellent nice to meet you, Jim. questions, Jim, by the way. Thanks for, for yeah. Um, yeah, joining in. It's been awesome. Uh, I really appreciate that. I hope, I hope you come to the next one. Happy so, to be <laughs> yeah, so, uh, yeah, Harai uh, has also asked, and he can ask this himself because his wife's asleep and he doesn't want everybody to be woken up in the house. So um, he asks, this is somehow a lame question because it is too general, but what is closer to a universally accepted merit-based reward system and who or what kind of value system leads to this merit-based reward system? And this has to be the last question because I've got to finish before the hour ends as I'm hosting another meeting. Okay. Um, well, I, I think this is easy because I don't think there is a universally accepted merit system. I think the uh, criteria for merit vary from occupation to occupation and employer to employer. But um, uh, I think it's very important that we examine this idea of meritocracy and merit, merit related reward in general, because it's um, based on the notion that the more education you get, the more of a contribution you're making, this kind of general notion. And I think that's quite evident that um, there are lots of college educated occupations that um, if anything are negative in their contribution to social value, if not neutral. And, you know, the, the whole dialogue around essential workers during the pandemic really underlined this point. It's like, it, who is an essential worker in, in our society? Is it the hedge fund manager? Is it the, uh, you know, the guy who sends jobs overseas and impoverishes his fellow citizens? Or is it the nurse and the teacher? And I think, Unfortunately, it didn't result in <laughs> both societies increasing their wages, but it did result in a, 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 a spate of discourse about essential workers. Thanks for the question. Nice to meet you all. Thanks for the opportunity, Adam. This is always fun. And um, I apologize if I sometimes seem a little spastic, but um, you know, I have been locked no up. No way, man. No, I really appreciate you joining us and, and talking <laughs> on such important topics. And it's great to have you um, come back and, and, uh, and comment on such a wide variety of things. But I do, I believe that you are one of the more, um, I guess, qualified to talk about the future of work with your sociology background and your um, interest in politics as well. So it has been fascinating. So I really appreciate that. And I'll have this online for everybody to watch who didn't make this meeting sometime in the future, hopefully very soon. So thanks so okay. much, James, for joining.